Hello, and welcome to another Center for Populist Urban Politics podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Lynn, and today is March 11th, 2022. And I am once again joined by Dmitry Orlov. Dmitry, hello. Hello. Great, you're coming through just fine. Uh, but for those of you who don't know who Dmitry Orlov is, uh, probably no one who's a regular subscriber uh, doesn't know who he is. But for those who are new, Dmitry Orlov is a writer. He's also an engineer. Uh, so you have a great technical background. You, your family came to the United States in 1976, and you were 13 at the time, Dmitry? That's right. And your father taught at Cornell University? Yes, Cornell, and then Harvard, and then Wesleyan. Mm -hmm. Great. And then now uh, you went back to the Soviet Union as it was collapsing, and you chronicled that. And you wrote, uh, you know, you lectured, you blogged, and you wrote that amazing book in 2011, I believe it was, Reinventing Collapse. And that's where I became familiar with you. And subsequent to that, you've written many other books. I think your most recent is uh, Arctic Fox, which is a that's collection right. of your essays, which was preceded by The Meat Generation. Uh, I have a number of your books uh, in, digital for, in digital format, but uh, one that I really love is Shrinking the Technosphere, in which you, uh, all of your books, you opine, you're a, a, a philosophical, social, political critic looking at modern times through, I think, a, with a really unique perspective. And what I'm going to love today is your perspective on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, you are currently living in St. Petersburg. And That's for right. the last several years, you've been all of your blogs. And I strongly recommend if you have not visited Club Orloff and joined your Patreon page, people need to because the information that you put out, it's, it's a, a perspective that most Americans don't get. And much like COVID uh, over the past couple years, we found that the truth is just getting pushed to the fringes because the mainstream media is an arm of the corporatocracy and that corporatocracy, uh, it just seems to be hell bent on uh, doing what's in the best interests of our elites and not uh, working men and women who are citizens of the United States of America. So Dimitri, I'd like to just jump right in and get your perspective. So the last week of February, 20, uh, last week of February, uh, 2022, uh, the, the, the shooting started in Ukraine. And, but this is something that's been building up for a while. And I'd like to get your historical perspective on that. How did we get well, here? How do we get to the last week of February? Well, um, you, you have to start with the collapse of the USSR or even before then. Um, uh, basically, what, when the USSR collapsed, what was left behind was Russia and a bunch of uh, countries that weren't really countries that, that did not have a tradition of, of sovereignty. And uh, all of them were uh, very much exploited by the West that basically just wanted their resources for free. And uh, especially Russia's resources, since that was mm -hmm. the, that is still the most resource rich country in the world. Um, and for a while that worked. And uh, after a while it stopped functioning because Russia is still a very, very powerful country. You know, perhaps not still, but forever. Uh, whereas the Ukraine was uh, sort of a, an er do well weakling. Uh, uh, it, it didn't have any internal cohesion. It didn't have any ethnic sovereignty because it, it's uh, a combination of, of regional groups that uh, are not really unifiable by, by any stretch of the imagination. And that was exploited by the United States, by the CIA, by the State Department. USAID, et cetera, 
to turn it into uh, an anti-Russia, to basically brainwash the population into thinking that Russia is its enemy, mm -hmm. and to basically brainwash it, train it to attack Russia. And to do that, they weaponized a bunch of Nazis that the United States and Canada uh, exported from Western Ukraine um, after the end of World War II and coddled and nurtured them and brought up new generations of little Nazis. And then when the Soviet Union fell apart, these were re-injected into the Ukraine and given lavish political and financial support until after the coup of 2014, they became the dominant political power in the country. And to this day, they're pretty much holding the entire country hostage, including the military, the mm -hmm. Ukrainian military. And they were being trained, brainwashed and trained, much like ISIS was in, in Iraq and Syria, um, by the United States to attack, to attack Russia. Um, the, the Russian involvement started perhaps a day, perhaps a week before uh, there was planned, as, as recently discovered documents show, before there was planned an all-out assault on the Donbass with the idea of penetrating into straight into Russia. Um, and the Donbass, for those who may not be familiar, the, that's a there's large pockets of people who are who speak Russian as their primary language are culturally probably politically aligned would consider some themselves Russian is that correct Dmitri no that's not correct there are pockets of people who speak Ukrainian which is basically a village dialect then there is this sort of official concocted Ukrainian language which everyone is forced to learn by going to school it is not their native language. The native language of the Ukraine is Russian, predominantly. Mm. Um, and strangely enough, as soon as Russian tanks roll in, everybody forgets their Ukrainian and starts speaking Russian again. So this is just a very, very thin veneer. People speak Ukrainian when they're frightened of the Nazis going after them for speaking Russian. Mm. But as soon as the Nazis are gone, they're back to being who they are, which is you know, 95% of the country speaks Russian as their native language. The Ukrainian is basically a weak language. There's not much published in it, not much written in it. It's basically for a bunch of poems and, and folk songs and fairy tales and things like that. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a folksy tradition. It's not a real language. Um, but the, the language of the country is Russian. And drawing lines between Russians and Ukrainians is sort of a silly exercise. Um, it's, it's possible to draw a line between West U Western Ukraine, where people do speak Ukrainian, and the rest of the country, mm -hmm. or the former country, as the case may be. But not so much in the eastern part, then? The eastern part is basically part of Russia that was handed over to this new entity called the Ukraine by, uh, by Lenin. It was, it, the Ukraine, in its current borders, is a Bolshevik creation. Interesting. Uh, now, also, too, so we have, you had mentioned the, the, these political boundaries and, and, and facts on the ground. But also, when you look at the demographics, you know, uh, you the people, I would imagine they're, they're Slavic, but I'm reminded of the book Clash of Civilizations by Samuel Huntington. And he looked at a line of demarcation in Eastern Europe, and that was along religious lines. You know, for instance, Poland, Lithuania are Roman Catholic, and they would tend to be more aligned with Western Europeans, whereas uh, those of Greek, uh, Greek Orthodox would be more aligned with Russia. Is, is that true? Do you find that to be true, uh, Dimitri? Is that how things should play out or are playing out? Well, Western, uh, Western Ukraine is a mix of things. A uh, mix of ethnicities. Some of it is Ukrainian, but there's there's also a Polish component and uh, Hungarian. Then there's a, a Russian enclave of Ka Carpathian Russians. Uh, so it's it's basically a very Balkan-like environment. The rest of uh, the Ukraine is uh, Russian and Russian Orthodox, former Russian provinces. 
is mm -hmm. what it's mostly made of. So it's basically Russia under a different name and drawing some kind of civilizational boundary through it. Um, I, don't, I don't know that that really applies and applying a religious standard given that uh, probably well over 50% are non-believers uh, of one sort or another is also not really practical. Now, the, mm -hmm. now the, the Baltics are a completely different story in, and each one is its own very special, strange case. Gotcha. Latvia, Estonia, uh, those countries you're referring to, Lithuania. That, that's right. You know, brushing on it, uh, again, it's territory that Peter the Great uh, purchased from Sweden for a thousand pieces of silver. Um, so they're basically squatters. Um, they're, they're also kind of name squatters. Okay, the Estonians, the Esti, uh, they're, they're sort of a local tribe. Um, the Russians set them up, the Soviets specifically set them up as kind of a Soviet Republic. Um, but they're really just a tribe. Um, the Latvians are similarly a tribe. The Lithuanians are several tribes that are name squatting because the Lithuanians are init initially Russians. They just happen to be pagan Russians as opposed to Orthodox Russians. You know, the, the great duchy, grand duchy of Lithuania was Russian speaking. Right. And it was really the, the Grand Duke. I can't recall his name. He was the one who de defeated the Teutonic Knights and mm -hmm. pretty much uh, stopped them as a scourge. Uh, and then, as I'm told, that the uh, the Duke was supposed to end up, you know, becoming the king. However, the crown got delayed in Poland and he uh, he died, and so it ended up the, the crown passed to Poland, and Lithuania became the duchy, uh, and part of which was part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth for many years. Yes, it was, and and the whole that whole area was a battleground between uh, the Vatican and the Moscow Patriarchate. To some to some extent, it still is. Right, I, you know, the visions of the Livonian Wars come to mind, the Cossack rebellions and Tatar invasions and <laughs> yes, Swedish there's a lot of invasions, history. a lot of history there. Well, Dimitri, can you, you had mentioned the coup of 2014. Can you talk about what happened in two, eight years ago in 2004, or actually uh, six years ago in 2014, and how that set us on a trajectory for today? Well, uh, at the time, there was uh, uh, President Viktor Yanukovych, who, who was uh, constitutionally elected as president of Ukraine. He was uh, a very corrupt, compromised person, a bit of a thief, but then that is standard for Ukrainian politicians ever since independence. They've been pretty much robbing their country blind. Uh, so that's par par for the course and, you know, goes with the territory. But the strange thing about him was that he uh, imagined that he could sort of play at switching sides. Today I'm going with the West, but I'm not getting the deal I want. So tomorrow I'm going with Moscow, but Moscow doesn't want to give me as much money to steal as I would like. So then I will continue my dalliance with the West. And um, what ended up happening was he uh, almost signed the cooperation agreement with the European Union and then did some uh, basic arithmetic and realized that it would bankrupt the country in a very short order. In what respect? So then he turned around. Mm -hmm. So then he turned around and said, well, no, we want to join the customs union, uh, which includes a lot of uh, Eurasian countries at this point. And, and be one with Moscow and trade with them, make them into our main partners. And that's when uh, the US uh, pulled the trigger. They, they basically shipped in a bunch of gunmen uh, and started uh, a shooting war right in the center of Kiev, right in the middle of demonstrations. And they shot a whole bunch of people. They blamed it on Yanukovych. Yanukovych instantly folded and fled to Russia where he remains to this day. And then Victoria Nuland of the US State Department installed a bunch of Nazis. 
And that's that famous phone conversation that was uh, released between that's her right. and uh, one, someone in the State Department there. And she's literally directing them which, who we were going to back, who we weren't going to back. Um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it, it was pretty damning. Um, and, well, yes. and Victoria Nuland is an arch neoconservative. I mean, that's her family. And for those Americans that don't really understand, they, they've probably heard the term neoconservative. And it's interestingly enough, you know, years ago when Ron Pearl was being interviewed on an NPR show, he literally, he said, I don't know how we ever got the moniker conservative. There's nothing conservative about us. In fact, we're quite radical. Uh, and they really are. They have this view, this Hobbesian view of the world uh, that, uh, it, you know, was formulated by their founder, Leo Strauss at University of Chicago. And their view is that uh, there's good and evil in the world, and we th there's no room for compromise. This is not someone, a Nixon Kissinger team, who would, at, at the height of the Cold War, like, well, let's cut the Russians, let's cut the Soviets a deal. Uh, Ronald Reagan, you know, we'll, we'll find a way through all of this. These guys know. Uh, they, they really are ideologues, and I think they're really dangerous at the end of the day because, you know, we're in this period of a fourth turning, and it's time for cooler heads to prevail, and none are to be found in, in that group of people. Well, uh, yes, Victoria Nuland is, is quite an interesting character to watch. She, she uh, I think she will go down in history uh, for uh, mouthing just three words, fuck the EU. That'll be her epitaph. That should be inscribed on her tombstone because the EU eight years later is now well and truly fucked. It has, it is dealing with uh, uh, probably between somewhere between uh, a million and a half and, and two million Ukrainian quote unquote refugees, uh, a lot of whom are brainwashed, insane Nazis. And the supreme irony would be if the Germans, of all people, have to organize concentration camps for Ukrainian Nazis, because they will run amok and they will basically shoot up the entire place. So, uh, and at the same time, the, the EU is dealing with this dilemma. They could commit suicide by stopping the import of, of uh, Russian energy products um, or not in which case they're not really going with the program. Um, and, and so they're, they're incredibly torn about it. But from the Russian perspective, they would not very much like to have to deal with uh, a festering corpse of the EU uh, over, over to its West. Um, mm -hmm. Russia happens to be quite fond of certain Western countries, Italy especially. Uh, and I understand, you know, now. Putin, Putin speaks German, correct? And he, yes. he seems to be a fan of German culture. Yes, well, he started out as a, a very much a pro Westerner. Uh, he, he really thought that uh, Russia could now join the family of European nations as an equal. And uh, that was not to be. And uh, at this point, um, his perspective is such that none of these Westerners can be trusted at all, that it's pointless to negotiate with them. It's pointless to sign deal with, deals with them. The only reason to continue talking with them is because Russia always talks to all sides, friends, enemies, uh, useless people over on the sidelines, because you just keep channels of communication open as, as, a, as a strategy uh, for collecting information. But there isn't going to be any deals with the United States because, or, or with the EU, because the EU lacks sovereignty and the United States is not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Uh, during the, the four years of the Trump administration, uh, I, I, I believe Trump rightly identified China as being the enemy of the United States, the true existential threat to the United States. Uh, but, and my, as I look at Russia now having to 
become more uh, entangled with China. I, you know, that that's a cautionary tale right there in many respects. Uh, they are uh, <clears throat> they're a resource hungry country that. Um, you know, was artificially create. You know, the, the modern China is, was created through moving over four million jobs to China through WTO and uh, general agreement on uh, tariff and trade deals that you know were just really one sided. And I think it's it kind of speaks to what's been going on because our elites have been profiting wildly over the last thirty years from. Uh, this cult of neoliberalism, which is the movement of people and money across international borders for one purpose, to maximize profits for a few. And it's been decimating the wage earning Americans here. And I, I'm not, and I, 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 I'm sure uh, uh, Russia would have had much more pro in difficulty with that group of people had a Putin uh, not arisen to kind of do what Trump was doing, uh, you know, America first, Russia first. And I think countries that have that mindset can actually work together and do deals. Uh, the neoliberal class, I don't know if we can really, uh, if, if, you know, we certainly haven't been able to work well with them here in this country. And, you know, I'm not sure how, you know, you know, and as you mentioned, they, you know, Russia uh, obviously has given up trying to work with them. Well, um, sort of going through what you said backwards, uh, uh, first of all, Putin is, is, is just basically uh, the right person at the right time. If it were not him, it would be someone else. Russia always produces such a figure at uh, critical moments in its history. Uh, that has always occurred. Uh, basically, circumstances create the person. Mm -hmm. not the other way around. That is the case throughout Russian history. Now, in terms of China uh, being an enemy of the United States, uh, you have to keep in mind who is China and who is the United States. The United States is nobody and nothing. It, it came into existence 10 seconds ago and it will wink out of existence in another 10 seconds. China is throughout human history the greatest nation on earth followed by India. If it were not for predations of, of Western colonialism, that would be the case uh, throughout history. But for the past few centuries, Western colonialism was big. Well, it's dead now. So now everything is going back to the way it always is, where Russia, China, and India, and Persia or Iran are some of the greatest countries on earth. And then there are these little islands of this and that uh, which are not long for this world. Well, I, I'd push back because what America has going for it in the long run is we have two big oceans uh, on our east and western sides. And to our north, uh, we have Canada. Uh, and to our south, we have Mexico. And so I, I in, in a way, we're in an enviable position that many other powers don't have, where the, the, the risk of, an, of actual invasion is greatly lessened by our geography. And I think we'll always have the ability to recoup. I just think over the past 40 years, we've fallen under the spell of some really nefarious people. These neoconservatives are one of them, the neoliberal cliques, the corporatocracy, the technocrats are another. And, you know, we, we will have to get to the business of draining the swamp I think if we're going to, you know, because we could, I believe, go out in a blink. Uh, domestic, who would have believed five years ago that we'd have seen the domestic unrest that we've seen over the last couple of years and we'll probably be seeing in the next couple of years as well. So, I mean, we certainly have our challenges. I, I believe we will rise to them, uh, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, we've been handicapped because we haven't had that moment where, you know, usually in, in, a, in a, an economy that is allowed to fail, a lot of the garbage gets squeezed out, pushed out, and we're able to rebuild. And we haven't been able to do that yet. Well, we'll see. 
Right. So let's, so 2014, um, there's a coup, a pro-Western um, person is installed uh, at that point. And take us forward, uh, Dimitri. Well, over the past eight years, uh, what's been happening is a civil war. Uh, the uh, uh, Crimea was uh, uh, an autonomous unit within uh, within the Ukraine that uh, had its own government, had its own parliament, etc. And so it uh, voted to secede and then held the referendum. And so as it as is its right under international law, it seceded from the Ukraine and then voted and appealed to Russia to join the Russian Federation and uh, their wish was granted. So uh, that is uh, you know, much more bulletproof a case uh, from the point of view of international law than, than say what happened with Kosovo, because there was a faked mm -hmm. humanitarian disaster there and there was the bombing of Belgrade, which was a war crime because there was no UN sanction for doing so. And um, uh, this was perfectly clear cut. Now, what happened in, in Donetsk and Lugansk uh, the, the Donbass region was a, a kind of slower and more disorganized secession uh, that, that wasn't as clear cut. Uh, there, was, uh, uh, there were some referenda, but they were inconclusive. And the idea was not to cause too big a stink, but try to somehow uh, shore up uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and and, and make it and fashion it into uh, some semblance of uh, a working country. But um, under US tutelage, uh, the Donbass was viciously attacked by the so-called anti-terrorist organization. Basically, the people in the Donbass, they didn't want to be Ukrainian, they wanted to be Russian. They spoke mm -hmm. Russian, they wanted Russian culture, Russian everything. They, they didn't want Ukrainian anything, really. And for that, they were viciously attacked. And for eight years, they were shelled. So there were 5,000, uh, over 5,000 people killed by the shelling. Lots and lots of real estate destroyed, including uh, uh, nurseries, maternity wards, hospitals, schools, etc. Uh, basically, civilian infrastructure was destroyed left and right. Um, uh, uh, just under 100 children were killed by the shelling, including just heinous war crimes, such as dropping bombs on kids playing in the yard from drone aircraft, that sort of thing. And, um, and that was treated as perfectly normal and not discussed in the West. Yeah, because there, there's been almost no coverage of it. There, there's been no coverage of it, certainly in mainstream media sources uh, here in the United States. Well, there was coverage of it in Russia because these are basically people who who would, you know, blog directly from where this was going on. It's like, here's my house being destroyed. Um, so there was no hiding it in Russia. And so uh, volunteers, including uh, people in Russia who had lots of military experience, uh, went as volunteers there to to fight and defend. And eventually, the uh, the volunteer force in in those regions became quite formidable, but they couldn't really push uh, push against uh, all of the Ukraine being mm -hmm. stuffed full of weapons by NATO, and trained and organized by NATO. And then uh, a couple of weeks ago, at the basically at the end of February, uh, this this uh, this thing happened where uh, it became clear that the Ukrainian side was basically going to attack. It was going to kill several hundred thousand people. Just and was, basically slaughter them. Because we and, saw early, didn't we see at the end of 2021, laws were passed that said you couldn't hold office if you didn't speak Ukrainian. And there were some other things that were obviously discriminatory to the Russian population uh, laws and ordinances passed. Uh, yes, this was basically just uh, um, some kind of like an, an, an orgy of uh, 
of fascism uh, directed against the Russian population, the Russian speaking population. They were for forbidden to speak Russian. Uh, they were forbidden to teach Russian. Uh, Russian TV channels were closed, uh, including uh, Ukrainian TV channels that were the least bit sympathetic to Russia. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, Russians were, um, who are the majority of the population, by the way, were declared uh, as non-native on, on, on Ukrainian land. Hmm. Um, Which and, means and, if, if you're a non-native, would you see, you know, taking, projecting that forward, people would have their lands confiscated, that kind of thing? Well, yes, basically, and, and Zelensky, the president, basically said, if you're not Ukrainian, then just go to Russia, get out of here. Uh, there's now, no a year ago, when you were looking at this from a very strategic geopolitical chessboard, uh, you pretty you you actually very accurately described these series of events but you had uh, you had a, you had advice for uh putin to do something different other than invade will you talk about that well yes um uh, putin does everything legally he's a lawyer he makes sure that all the i's are dotted and the t's are crossed uh, never violates international law and under the circumstances all he could do legally was basically invite everybody from the Donbass region uh, to uh, to leave and to go to Russia and this was consistent with various other things he said Russia doesn't need any more territory it has plenty but it could certainly use some more uh, Russians mm -hmm. uh, so here were some Russians who would be welcome. Uh, and, and what, uh, what numbers are we talking in, in terms of the possible, you know, what would have, in terms of the patriation, about how many people would we be, would we be talking about, Dimitri? Several million. Okay. So not so, a small number. No. Uh, but the problem was that even though several hundred thousand of these several million uh, accepted Russian citizenship, applied for it and got Russian passports, etc., uh, and very much wanted their region to become part of Russia, they were not going to give up their land. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's, that's where that stayed. They, they were going to die defending their land if necessary. And if, if the Russians didn't come to their aid, then shame on the Russians. That was basically their stand. So um, was it really you know, Putin realized he was backed into a political corner. I mean, what would have happened to Putin politically in Russia had he not acted the way he did, do you think? I don't know. And it's a pure hypothetical because uh, it is highly unlikely that he would have done nothing. Uh, he doesn't he doesn't make all decisions by himself. He's not just, you know, he's not a one man orchestra. There, there um, tens of thousands of people who stand behind Russian policy on all things. Um, it's a collegiate sort of exercise mm -hmm. um, in making decisions. He makes the ultimate decision, but uh, not on all things and not all the time. So I don't know. I, uh, I don't know what would have happened. But then something else happened entirely, which is uh, um, uh, Russia took the tack of uh, trying to negotiate with the US and with the European Union so that they would abide by the agreements they had signed for collective mm -hmm. security, which they neglected by relentless NATO expansion eastward, which they had promised not to do. Right, because that's and getting those... back to Gorbachev's um handshake or verbal agreement with the West, essentially, correct? Yes, and, and there is this uh, clash of cultures. You see, uh, uh, in, in the West, you can say, well, you didn't get it in writing. So, uh, you know, off you go. Um, uh, what you say isn't illegal. In Russia, if you say that, you, you need new teeth right away. <laughs> you know, just like next stop is your dentist, because 
if you do if you behave that way that way you're not even a man okay it's a, a man is a man of his word not some lawyerly piece of paper but the promise you made in this case a promise was made not to uh not an inch to to the east was mm -hmm. the phrase used everybody said that that was said the fact that there isn't a signed piece of paper is just not significant not to the russians so they tried to kind of bring the us and and uh, and and uh, nato well nato doesn't really make decisions it's the us that makes decisions but but bring these people to their senses and say look you've you've signed all of these agreements uh and and you verbally agreed um to do this so do this and instead they got this uh, willingness to discuss things further and blah 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 and okay so so basically russia had to take uh forceful steps to safeguard its security from that point on because further discussions would be fruitless and then the, uh, the and then the ultimate uh cause for war causes belly was uh, when when President Zelensky of, of the Ukraine at the Munich Security Conference said that the Ukraine intends to develop nuclear weapons. Now, it, it can't actually, it, and everybody- Are, are there scientists, leftover scientists who are, you know, who remained in the Ukraine with, you know, that kind of knowledge? Uh, there's a huge stockpile of uh, spent nuclear fuel, high-level nuclear waste, and there's plenty of ballistic rockets left over from the uh, Soviet days. So there's plenty of stuff to build dirty bombs and lob them at Russia in violation of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And so if the West doesn't really care about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, then it's really up to Russia to go, at, go ahead and... Uh, and, and uh, impose, impose it on whoever wants to violate it. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's part of it. And then on the way it was discovered that the, the Americans in, in, in the Ukraine were uh, developing um, very strange bacteriological agents uh, that were designed to attack Slavic people specifically and were designed to be carried by migratory birds that happened to pass through Ukraine and then through Russia. And hmm. that documentation has been discovered. That is currently being discussed at the UN Security Council. And I'm, because, sure, I'm sure it will get as much coverage as evidence that COVID was created in a lab in Wuhan will get here in the West. Although, but finally, things are coming out, and most sane, rational people will agree that more than likely it came from a lab. I was always convinced it came from a lab in Wuhan. What I didn't, I still don't feel comfortable with in terms of what I know about that is what was the involvement of the Chinese Communist Party and what was the involvement of uh, our, our government. Uh, and, you know, because we know the National Institute of Health under Fauci was involved in that because they had pitched our Department of Defense on doing gain of function with bats. And they were like, no, you're batshit crazy. You're not going to do that here in this country. So they found, you know, a lab in Wuhan to do it. And, you know, I, I, so if we if it could happen in Wuhan like that, I see no reason uh, I'd have to be convinced that it couldn't happen in a country like Ukraine. Well, Ukraine is absolutely, uh, you know, helpless as far as uh, standing up to the U.S. The U.S. could basically kill a million Ukrainians and the Ukrainian government would be, okay, well, at least it's the Americans doing it. We feel, we feel so flattered. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so now let's talk about that last week in February, uh, the invasion, uh, how it's going, how from a Russian perspective, uh, we talked about, you know, the justification for it. How do you feel the invasion is going and what are your thoughts on where will it go? Are there territorial uh, aspirations or is this a, 
an incursion that will uh, come back, let's say, go back, will it just go back east of the Dnieper River or will it go all the way back to the borders of Russia? What are your thoughts, Dmitry? Well, um, the, initial, uh, the, the initial effort was uh, basically uh, a, uh, something that the, Russian, the Russians call uh, a, a, a reconnaissance th through battle, <laughs> battle reconnaissance. It's basically when, when, you know, you don't know when, whether somebody can throw a punch or not, so you punch them in the face. If they punch back, then you know something, you've discovered mm -hmm. something that you didn't before. So the basic assumption going into this was that the Ukrainian military was basically a bunch of recruits and a bunch of war criminals. And okay, the recruits are just going to be fed, bandaged up and sent home. And, and the war criminals are going to get killed. And then uh, everybody will be overjoyed and uh, everything will be fine from then on. We'll hold elections and uh, elect a, a, a real government and pass a real constitution that in accordance with the written in accordance with the Minsk agreements, which are sanctioned by the UN Security Council and generally agreed upon. Uh, and everything would go back to normal. Well, what that reconnaissance mission accomplished, well, first of all, they, they grabbed a huge amount of, of the country, something like a third is, is under Russian control. Um, but, and, and it did prove that the Ukrainian military is helpless and hopeless, doesn't want to fight, they just want to go home. And most of them did at this point. Uh, but then it was discovered that uh, there is maybe 600,000 people in the Ukraine who have blood on their hands from the last eight years of uh, the shelling of civilian districts in the Donbass. And they are what uh, Donald Rumsfeld would have referred to as dead enders. Hmm. They're going to fight to the death. They're going to use civilians as human shields. They're right now busy basically ejecting pregnant women from maternity wards, maternity clinics, because they know, they think, they know that the Russians are not going to attack them if they're holed up in a maternity clinic, you know, strategies like that. And so this is a little bit more like battling ISIS in Syria. ISIS is another group of maniacs trained by the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. and, and this yeah, and the CIA. Um, yeah, guilty. I mean, look, uh, look at Libya. Look at Syria. These are all mercenary forces that, uh, unfortunately, yeah. we unleashed on these countries, uh, and <laughs> we have a pretty bad track record uh, post World War II in terms of actual winning conflicts. Uh, there's a lot, you know. We have some really stupid thoughts uh, on how to conduct. Uh, insurgency, counterinsurgency operations, and we don't do it very well. And uh, unfortunately, I think we, you know, it's politicians. I know, you know, one example just this week, where we've seen our military actually pushing back was our political leaders would be fine with the polls ref refurbishing old MIGs and transporting them to Ukraine. Uh, but our military was like, no, that could uh, escalate into World War III. I don't think we're going to do it. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Well, what's happening now is, you know, the, the realization has, has hit that these are terrorists and there's lots of them. They're using terrorist tactics, such as using civilians as human shields. And um, now lots of people in Iran, Iraq, and Syria uh, who've been involved in, in the uh, ISIS cleanup in that region. You know, ISIS has been very well demolished there. Mm -hmm. They're chomping at the bit to go and join the fray. And today Putin said, okay, well, if they want to help out, that's great. Uh, their, uh, their specific niche is killing US trained, US armed terrorists. So if they can do it in Syria, they can do it in the Ukraine. And that's just fine. 
So now there is going to be a countrywide, you know, mission to kill all the terrorists. Um, and now, uh, that... the other thing that oh go, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, just an, one more element to add. The other thing that this uh, um, battle reconnaissance mission has uncovered is that the the people of 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 Ukraine have been so incredibly brainwashed over the past eight years because uh, specifically the U.S. has thrown so much money at a, a fake news media coverage, just basically bombing, carpet bombing the country with fake news, that everybody there is completely brainwashed and 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 convinced that first of all they they are mighty and they will they will defeat Russia and at the same time quaking in their boots as the Russians approached, convinced that the Russians are ruthless maniacs who are going to kill them. And when the Russians show up and, and hand out loaves of bread, they, they just, you know, their, their, their minds snap, you know, and, and they become sort of, you know, they enter a weird dream state where they cannot reason rationally about anything at all. Um, and that sort of thing uh, takes many years to overcome. You know, it's, it's sort of uh, cult members, you know, they, they go through a, a lengthy period of recuperation from the psychological damage that was caused to, caused to them. Now, imagine a country of what, what's left there, 25 million people who are basically members of a suicide cult. And that's Which, what Russia is dealing with now. But at the, so, but it, it's unfortunately, when you look at it from terms of real politic, uh, Russia probably doesn't have the means to carry on a protracted war. It's, Why not? Uh, it's expensive. Uh, the ruble is not the world reserve currency. The ability the to- The war has yeah. nothing to do with the ruble. The war has absolutely nothing to do with, with the exchange rate. Yeah, but why, was it, why, why has America been able to wage, like in Vietnam, a 10-year war, uh, Iraq, without really forcing the, the citizenry to, to sacrifice in any way, to give up any luxury, because we have the ability to debt? And I don't see Russia having that ability. So far, what the Russia, what Russians have used up is um, pretty much within within budget for uh, annual training exercises. Same thing with Syria. Mm. Um, the, the the casualties, uh, we don't know what they are. That's a state secret until the mission is over. But it's in the hundreds, uh, which is considering that these are professional soldiers is, is, is not very big. The kill ratio is, is something like 10 to one. I've heard reports of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is, this is nothing, nothing major. Uh, the Russians are not planning to occupy the country forever. Uh, this is an incursion, not an occupation. They're basically passing through and cleaning the place out. They're sort of like army ants that go through your house and uh, eat all the dead animals hiding in the corners and then leave. Uh, that's, that's the extent of, of the mission. So uh, the, the end result will be a Ukraine that is federalized, uh, a, f a federation or a confederacy. Mm -hmm. uh, it may splinter into a bunch of separate countries, some under uh, Russian control. The Russians will probably control the coastline, all of it. Uh, and um, uh, some of it will will just be kind of left to fend for itself pretty much, but it will be disarmed. It will never be part of any military pact again. It will have no weapons uh, worth mentioning, you know, small arms, that sort of thing, but that's pretty much it. Nothing beyond what's necessary for local police action. And uh, that'll be it. And then the Russians will pull out. I just um, don't see this administration. And when I say this administration, I'm really not talking about Biden and Harris. I'm talking about the cabal behind them. The fact that Victoria Nuland was hauled out of 
and brought back in with, you know, she was part of the Obama administration and now she's back in with the Biden administration just shows you that uh, they're just changed. They're, they're just changing mass. It's the same people. And my experience with them, my knowledge of them is they're not going to allow this to lie. They're not, they will foment an insurgency uh, and a probably large insurgency. And, you know, no one, no commander in the field wants to fight an insurgency that's in an urban area. I mean, it's just, it's, and they're, they're costly. Uh, you never really win. That, that's my, when I look at, you know, this, this armed incursion into Ukraine, you know, if you don't have a, a real end game, a, 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 you know, this, we, we have, you know, gained victory when we have taken Kiev or we have taken this area or. Well, please tell me who cares about Kiev? Well, Kiev is more, I think it's more symbolic, correct? Being uh, the capital. The Russians do, Kiev does not militarily threaten Russia. Kiev is not a military threat. Major cities are not military threats. The Russia is interest, Russians are interested in destroying all war material and destroying the entire military structure, mm -hmm. rounding up all the war criminals and either shooting them or imprisoning them, putting them on trial, etc. Um, and, and then basically shutting the country uh, out from from foreign incursions of any sort, basically mm -hmm. uh, providing for its external security. Its internal security is up to the Ukrainians themselves. They can go on killing each other for generations, for all Russia is concerned, as long as they don't pose a threat to Russia itself. Remember, it's the causes belly is that the Ukraine directly threatened Russia. If the Ukraine no longer directly threatens Russia, then there is no longer a mission. Because isn't really everything predicated on this, you know, uh, Russia having what I would term a valid uh, security interest in exactly. the Ukraine. Exactly. And it's probably our failure to acknowledge that. Um, and I'm not because we'd seen this before play out with Georgia and South Ossetia. Uh, when we had advanced a little too aggressively and the bear swatted back. Uh, so this should not have been, you know, beyond the pale that Russia would, you know, invade Ukraine if pushed the way they were. Uh, my concern is, again, with this crowd uh, running our country, that uh, they're not going to allow the Ukraine, you, the, the Ukraine to acquiesce to surrender they, they'll they're they'll probably create a government in uh in in absentia uh outside ukraine to keep things fomented so you know that that's how i see this playing out okay i i don't i see this playing out in a slightly different way but i i see the u.s involvement in the whole thing as rather circumscribed because i don't know how long the u.s still has to run hmm. uh remember russia hasn't really applied any pain to the various pressure points it has um the u.s tried to ban the import of uh, russian oil all that means is that it'll get that oil from another source and pay more for it uh, if and we are. are the Americans sell. are beginning, just beginning to see the, the issues at the pump. And oddly, um, in my newsletter that comes out tomorrow, the title of it will be uh, A Crisis of, Con of Confidence Deja Vu. You know, I recall when we were kids, we were going through something very similar. And there was Jimmy Carter. You know, God bless him. The guy understood that we were vulnerable from an energy perspective and we needed to change our ways and uh he was pretty much that was his, his speech that he gave called a crisis and confidence was droll boring and uh, it probably lost him you know the, pre the the election to reagan because americans weren't prepared at that time to sacrifice and I don't know if we are prepared to do that again, but 
as you had mentioned, uh, we were <laughs> like when we got together here in Lancaster four or five years ago, and we had our panel discussion, someone characterized it as the Doomer Super Bowl. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> my, my thoughts on the US continuing as it has, as energy dependent as we are, are not good. In the long run, we're going to have to do a lot of resizing uh, in order to just simply survive. Uh, we've built this huge urban landscape that requires the automobile. Uh, we've acquiesced to all of these things that just destroy the wage earning class. The uh, outsourcing, the offshoring of good manufacturing jobs, the outsourcing of good white collar jobs, and eventually offshoring those to low rent countries, uh, our inability to um, get rid of the automobile. It's still very, you know, I, as you know, I've f fashioned a lifestyle where if need be, I don't need an automobile. I have one. It's a 2004 Subaru uh, that I keep on the road, but we're we are coming, I think, to that point where we've run. We'll, it, we'll, we only will have consequences to deal with, and at that point, all of a sudden, you can't fund foreign military ventures. Uh, let alone. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and that that that's exactly right, and. The thing is that, you know, smart people have been warning Americans that there's going to be a resource crisis. Well, congratulations, you're in the middle of one right now. And uh, the inflation that you're seeing, that's not monetary inflation, that's structural inflation. Monetary inflation is when there's uh, too much money and, and prices go up. Structural inflation is when money becomes worthless because no amount of money will get you what you need to keep the system going. That's the point where we're at now. So the specific uh, example of oil, uh, all of the oil produced on the American continent is light oil. By itself, mm -hmm. it is useless for making diesel, which is what the whole for economy diesel, runs correct. on. Mm -hmm. Diesel and, and jet fuel, uh, the heavier fractions. To make the heavier fractions, uh, petroleum chemists have uh, uh, arrived at a devious scheme of mixing this light oil with heavy oil, um, which can come from a number of places. It could come from Venezuela. It right. Can come the from Orinoco Russia. is really heavy, almost too heavy. <laughs> That's right. It's basically tar. Mm -hmm. uh, it can come from Russia, the Urals, and, and Mazut 100 is a, another product that Russia has plenty of. Mm -hmm. and, and it can c come from Iran. So look at what's happening now. Americans make noises about uh, not importing Russian oil. Okay, then they go, they send a high level mission to Venezuela uh, and to talk to Maduro, who is suddenly uh, not, no longer the usurper, usurper forget Juan Guaido, uh, who knows where mm -hmm. he is. Um, but Maduro is now the person to talk to. They talk to Maduro, Maduro tells them, uh, to basically go away and not bother him. Uh, and, and then there's the tiny little thing that the American delegation doesn't know, just the Venezuela, the entire Venezuelan oil, uh, oil industry is owned by a certain government. But guess which government that is? I'm going to guess China. Russian. Russia. Really? Venezuelan oil business is owned by the Russian government not even any particular Russian oil company, but, but directly by the government. Really? Venezuelan oil is a Russian sovereign interest. Okay, so what was the point of that? And then they go and talk to Iran, and <laughs> Iran is like, okay, well, let's go back to the nuclear deal and get, guess, who, guess who brokers uh, that agreement, going back to the nuclear deal. Oh, that and would guess be Guess which country? That would be Russia. Okay, mm -hmm. so we got Russia. Russia and we got Russia. Uh, so then you can talk to the United Arab Emirates and you can talk to Saudi Arabia and guess what happens when Biden tries to talk to their leaders? 
I imagine we have to look at what happened in 2018, the meeting between Putin and uh, the Saudis. So I would imagine we would be running into the Russians again there. Well, more specifically, those people don't even answer Biden's phone calls anymore. Wow. They just don't pick up the phone. Okay, so what, what is the United States left with now? Uh, shut down their economy, no longer deliver food to supermarkets, or just do whatever Russia tells them to do. That's the choice. And if they don't like that choice, Russia can sweeten the deal by no longer selling enriched uranium to the United States, which means lights out. 25% of all of electricity in the United States is produced using Russian enriched uranium. The United States no longer has uranium enrichment technology. They never quite figured out how to do it. They have some European, limited European capacity on US soil, but this year, these are European companies. These are not American companies. And, and they might have their own game going, their own interest. So basically, whichever way you look at it, if you want to keep your country, you can, you can keep your country, but you have to do whatever Russian tell, tells you to do. You, you, you can, you no longer, as Americans, no longer have the, the, the leisure of basically pissing off Russia left and right and expecting to stay alive. And it doesn't even take a war. Harsh choices, harsh choice, uh, choices, choices. Um... The, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we all know it's about energy. It's all about oil. Uh, we created a lot of competitors over the last 30, 40 years for that oil. We should not have. Um, personally, for those who don't know me, because when I put this out, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that know you and don't know me. Uh, my activism started after I got out of the military in the early 90s, and I worked for Ross Perot, initially on his campaign as a volunteer, and then I worked for him for two years from 92 to 94. Uh, so I always tell people, I was America first before it was cool. And mm -hmm. then, of course, I fought NAFTA, GATT, the WTO, left politics for a while, just got into corporate accounting, and uh, then got back actually into progressive politics and just found myself hitting a wall again and again and try as I might to wake up uh, my fellow citizens. I'm branded a kook and I'm sure after this podcast, Dimitri, I will be branded a traitor by a lot of people. Um, I think that that's inevitable. That's, that's just a function of telling the truth in the environment. Uh, the media environment as it exists in the US today, telling the truth is an act of treason. Mm -hmm. And th the tragic thing is, this conversation we're having now, uh, it's been pushed to the fringes, it will be on YouTube, uh, which will probably get taken down, it'll be on BitChute and Rumble, because this will be the first podcast that I put on those uh, platforms. But mm -hmm. that's where it happens. So all of a sudden, we're these uh, crazy, once again, we're the crazy conspiracy theorists. And yet, you know, uh, Americans just seem to be on the steady diet of propaganda. I, you know, um, being in the military in the 1980s, uh, our, we were always focused on the Soviet threat. And what we would learn of propaganda, the state propaganda mechanisms, is that the average Russian, the, the average Russian, the typical Russian, you know, would listen to them and know it's bullshit. And then they'd go off and talk to each other, their friends and family and everything. But here in the United States, uh, they are looking at CNN, uh, CNBC, uh, ABC, and they are thinking that this is the truth. This is the way the world is. And they don't realize you know, it's not just the lies, but it's also lies of omission uh, because we don't see other perspectives and it would be so helpful to the environment. You know, I mentioned that uh, panel we did five years ago. Do you know that the local newspaper gave it absolutely no coverage before or after? Uh, and when a friend of mine who used to work at the paper before he retired had asked them about it, they said, oh, 
we're not going to listen to those yahoos. I mean, that's the mentality. If those, if people had come, if those people had come to that lecture, they would have understood the concept of peak oil. They would have understood, you know, imperial overreach. Uh, so many concepts that would right now, you know, myself a week ago, Dimitri, I, I put it on Twitter. I said, I've taken profits. Because I said a few months ago that when everything is flashing green and I'm up a certain percentage, I'm getting rid of all my equities. And I was in energy and mining and other sectors. Um, and a couple other things, uh, commodities. And I mean, where is so everyone I know, every, they, all their gains over the last year have been erased. You know, they're looking at their 401ks and they're wondering, oh my God, what, you know, should I buy the dip or not? It's like, no, no, <laughs> you should have been out, you know, several years ago. But unfortunately, people don't have access to that kind of information. So. That, that's the great tragedy to me in all of this. Yes, well, people uh, choose to be ill-informed in a lot of cases. Very few people uh, go out of their way to, to dig out uncomfortable truths. Uh, that, that is a rarity. Uh, luckily, I have some readers. You know, a few thousand people actually uh, like what I put out and, and value what, what I offer. And that is a great gift, and I I should be, and I am, grateful what I for what I have, and uh, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not envious of uh, people who have a larger audience who uh, lie all day. <laughs> but I'll tell you, and again to to my uh, viewers, uh, cluborlov.com, correct. Dimitri? Club cluborlov.com still kind of works. I'm not sure what it does. And then but Patreon, it's Club correct. Orlov. Yes, Patreon. Uh, Patreon slash Orlov and works and subscribe star slash Orlov. And then uh, a public blog uh, where I publish little snippets and previews is on WordPress. So that's cluborlov.wordpress.com. Fantastic. What I'd like to do. Uh, Dimitri is close out you know you're living in St. Petersburg now yeah uh, which I've I've not been there I have I've been to a few Eastern European countries but that's as far as I've gotten um, tell tell my viewers what it's like to live in St. Petersburg what it's like to live in Russia today well uh, I was I spent uh, three hours in traffic today going all over the place uh, the city is just absolutely clogged because the level of activity has accelerated to a huge extent. Hmm. A lot of a lot of Western companies have pulled out or or ceased operation <laughs> in Russia, uh, and this has uh, freed up huge market niches in everything from IKEA furniture to uh, to to Swiss watches, whatever, um, and Russian companies are right now availing themselves of uh, uh, very low interest rates from the government to start businesses mm -hmm. or to expand businesses. Mm -hmm. And they're just lunging at the opportunity to, to occupy these market niches before these Western companies change their minds, uh, you know, say to themselves, oh my God, what have we done? And try rushing back in. Um, so there, there's a, just a, a massive market expansion. The other thing is that uh, a lot of companies, big ones such as uh, Oracle, uh, such as Microsoft, Adobe, uh, have announced that they will no longer be selling products to Russia. And what that means is that their intellectual property is now free to Russians. Wow. Their patents are extinguished and are made engineer public property. It. Well, I've not, always not said, even reverse engineer it. Just continue using their software. Just crack it so it was, doesn't require an activation say, code, and go ahead and use it. Yeah, from a security standpoint, uh, Microsoft is Swiss cheese. If there there's a Russian version that can you know turn that into something else, that would be. I think that would be very welcome and a serious competitor on the world market. 
Well, I, I haven't used Microsoft for years, but when I did, I would only Russian run cracked, fixed up Russian versions because mm. they were bulletproof. Because really? Russian engineers, what they do is they take Microsoft products, they decompile them, they fix a whole bunch of security holes, and and then they 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 make it live for free. Mm -hmm. And and so that was a good way to go. But Microsoft is generally junk. Um, so uh, there, there are huge, huge uh, opportunities that Russia is availing itself of right now. There's a lot to do. Uh, and people are just incredibly busy. They have all the money they need. They have all the resources they need. Uh, they, the, the one thing that is in, in short supply is skilled labor. So uh, Westerners who don't like uh, what's going on in their country, they should just come to Russia. And they should bring, a, a, you know, a flash drive with all the secret proprietary information uh, when they come. Interesting. Um, well, there you go. It's... Uh... We, we're, we're seeing, unfortunately, I think we, this great disruption, this time of chaos is upon us. I'm thinking the next couple of years are going to be really, really rough. Uh, then, you know, as a country, we'll get through it. Um, you know, I'm hoping for a time when uh, Russia and the United States, you know, will be able, to, you know, our leaders will be able to sit across from each other and, you know, craft constructive deals that help both countries move along and navigate, you know, the, the world. Um, it doesn't seem possible now, but I really believe it is. I think historically, you know, the Russians and Americans have gotten along well. Historically, Americans and Persians have gotten along well, you know, up to the 1950s. We had an amazing relationship with Iran. Um, in fact, well, when they created their first republic. Well, you know, just, you know, you can say a lot of positive things about that, but right now Americans should push their leaders to come clean about their biological weapons programs. Agreed. Agreed. Because without that, there will be no trust. There will be no sitting down with their leaders. There will just be pain and punishment. The well, people should we... take that very, very seriously. Well, I'm certainly looking forward to getting all the information that could be made available on those. And, you know, Americans need to know. Again, Project Veritas did an amazingly good sting operation on attempts to do the gain of function here in the US that were rejected that they eventually did in Wuhan, you know. Um, and, you know, again, perhaps when Americans start to really feel the pain, you know, and unfortunately it'll be at the pump and other places at, at the supermarket, maybe they'll wake up to, you know, things we've done and how we need to course correct. So, anywho, Dimitri, is there anything else that uh, you, you want to leave with our viewers? Well, um, you know, there's, there's, a, a, there, there's a, a kind of a painful thing to, for me to mention, but um, I sort of feel like the United States and Russia are waving goodbye to each other. Um, I don't think that there's going to be a lot of contact moving forward. I'm a little concerned about that because I do have readers in, in the US and around the world in the English speaking part of the world. And it may just turn out that the contact will be lost. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of a precarious lifeline. I mean, uh, basically speaking while Russian is becoming a crime in the West. And I'm Russian. Well. <laughs> Having uh, a Russian cat will get your cat put put, put out or being a Russian, um, you know, uh, director at a Philharmonic will get you fired, you know, these days, which is rather pretty ridiculous and petty. That's right. And what what the Russians are thinking about now is that, you know, we, we have to get our, get our people out of the United States. We have to get our people out of Europe. And unfortunately, a lot of people are resistant because they've been, again, Brainwash, brainwashed by Western media. Uh, but uh, yeah, plus the airspace is closed, so it's impossible to send mm -hmm. lots of jets over and pick them up. 
but it's, it's going to be a kind of a difficult time keeping that line of communication open. I see that as a big mm. problem coming up. Yeah, you could, you could be right. You could be right. I, I, I hope you're wrong, but you know, based on what I've I hope I'm I've wrong seen. too. I want to continue doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And you do great work. Well, Dimitri, uh, I want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, this is a perspective many people here in the United States don't get to uh, hear, and I know people are going to appreciate it. I think there are others that will not. So we'll see, uh, you know, how long I'm able to uh, continue doing what I do. But, well, it's, uh, a, it's a great effort. Thank you for, for taking the time. Well, thank you. And I want to take a moment to thank our viewers. Um, be sure to subscribe. Like I said, this will be the first video that I'll be putting up on BitChute and Rumble. Uh, and you can always find us at cfpup.org. Uh, we haven't been maintaining that because I've been involved with a lot of other platforms, uh, our US tech workers uh, and Doctors Without Jobs and a few other uh, projects that have kept us really busy. But we're going to get back into, and perhaps a lot like you, Dimitri, uh, chronicle this decline of America as we see it unfolding in this fourth turning. So again, Dimitri, thanks so much for your time. Thank you.